And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight, coming to us straight from the from the realms of humble of fumble GDR, and the and the creators of the of the upcoming um, um Knights of the Round Academy, beca because we, because we because anyone who said we are not weeb enough here in the temple, well, it's, it's time to prove that wrong. <laughs> the the one and only um the the man better known as Claudio. Hi there. Uh, how you doing today, man? Oh, really fine. Uh, it's been a nice weekend. We had a gaming convention yesterday, so I had the chance to let someone play in real life uh, for once instead of through a computer. So it was really, really great to have someone play my game uh, mm -hmm. with dice and uh, talking to each other in front, one in front of another. So it's really a great weekend. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to I'd like to start off at the, with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, I started playing in high school uh, with a bunch of my classmates, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one of our teachers uh, was the dungeon master. So it was kind of weird because. We stayed uh, after school to play with a teacher, uh, but it was great because uh, we were really close to each other. We were old classmates, and we went on playing for uh, four years after high school. Um, I kept playing with uh, other groups as well, mm -hmm. and um, at one point uh, I started my own uh, podcast, an actual play podcast mm -hmm. with uh, some of my friends. Uh, we were actually the first Italian actual play podcaster, so it's been a long ride. And um, in these nine years of uh, of gamer uh, on the podcast, uh, a lot of what we tried in the podcast uh, stayed with me, and uh, now I'm trying to put that into my games. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I came to when I came to doing your first. When it came to doing actual plays, um, was there was were there a few that served as an influence for you to try that particular avenue out? Uh, yeah, we were listening to One Shot podcast mm -hmm. at the time, and the Penny Arcade um, actual plays. So we started from there, and mm -hmm. um, we made the, the first uh, season of our show as a. Um, 32 episodes campaign then we started trying different games uh, uh, in the same uh, story mm -hmm. so we started playing flashbacks uh, to try different games as one shot did so mm -hmm. those were our first uh, influences on the podcast and how we started playing from there so oh. All right. Now, with that, now with that in mind, let's let's delve a little let's delve a little bit wholesale into night into Knights of the Round um, Academy. Um, now, this is this is of course your um, this is of course your second major Kickstarter coming coming off the heels of um, not of not the end. Which congratulations on that getting Game of the Year back in twenty twenty. Thank you. Um, how did the how did the idea for do, for doing something like Knights of the Round come come about? Uh, well, it actually started with uh, Not the End because uh, there's a scenario in the core book of Not the End uh, I wrote, and that was Knights of the Round. Mm -hmm. I love uh, uh, giant mechas and uh, anime, mm -hmm. and I also love uh, the Arthurian legends. Mm -hmm. So when when we had uh, to write some scenarios for the um, core book of Not the End, I started thinking, uh, how can I 
mix those uh, and uh, the first draft for Knights of the Round came uh, around. But um, in at the end, uh, you don't play kids, you don't play students, you play the heroes of the realm. Mm -hmm. You have this giant mecha, you are capable of uh, pilot. And um, we started a small campaign on our Discord server um, to showcase the, the game to our followers. Mm -hmm. We ran uh, 12 uh, or 13 uh, sessions of the Knights uh, of the Round uh, scenario. And when we were finished, I started thinking, uh, how can I make this uh, more anime? And the first thing that came to mind was to set, in, set it in a school. So there would be a lot of uh, teen drama, love, friendship uh, and, and the likes. And um, I started by writing a six pages hack for not the end. And by the end of the next week, uh, they were 60 pages and then they became 160. And now it's over 300 pages uh, worth uh, of content. Mm -hmm. uh, and with, given the, given the fact that you're combining three combining um three particular avenues that that one would cons that one would consider not not having all that much over overlap um i'd like to delve into that aspect so first the Arthur the arthurian legends part of it what 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 about that particular mythos um drew you uh well i loved Arthurian legends since mm -hmm. I was a, a little kid, so mm -hmm. I always had something uh, um, of Arthur and Lancelot and Bediver and all the knights of the round table stuck in my head uh, at some point. And the idea I liked the most was the round table, because uh, at the round table there was no um, no king and no servant; they were all the same. They were all peers. Mm -hmm. And that was an idea that stuck with me, and uh, I found uh, while I was writing Knights of the Round that it fit, it fit uh, perfectly the whole idea of uh, we are all the same and we have to work together to reach our goal to and complete our quest. And uh, that stuck with me a lot. Mm -hmm. Plus, it was uh, really nice to have the chance to... Um, joke about the names uh, of the knights themselves in the game and um, the first uh, name i tried to change for for the game i think it was mordred mm -hmm. and uh, it almost instantly became more dread um, so you knew he was a spooky person a creepy person uh, someone with a dark past and uh, from there, I, uh, it was an avalanche of names that came to my mind. And to be f to be fair, going with going with that kind of punnage is completely in keeping with it, with anime, given 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 Japan's obsession with wordplay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I got, I I was exposing to I was exposing a friend of mine to to um common writer wizard, um. Not too long ago, and he kept asking why, why, every, why every spell the hero keeps keeps using on his rings um, ended with ended with please, and I, and I just said, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Please is the magic word. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of that in the in the game as well. Uh, not only the names of the characters, but the places, uh, the um, the games, the the students will play. Um, the teams of the other academies, uh, everything I try to put in as a pun or as a wordplay or as a joke. So mm -hmm. that kind of uh, anime talk, it's uh, it's really part of the game. Yeah. Um. Now, the the pick. The approach of go the approach of going with um, real with real robot. If 
if I'm not mistaken, you're le you're leaning you're leaning more in, more in the realm of the kind of the kind of mech design that sun that sunrise would that sunrise would put out. Whether it be, of course, the the big do the big dog in the room being Mobile Suit Gundam, but also um, Vision of Escaflone, brain powered, and Code Geass. Um, yeah. What made you lean more towards the real robot end of the spectrum, despite the fantastical end of the setup? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, first of all, because the themes mm -hmm. of the real robot genre are uh, more interesting um, for a game like this. Mm -hmm. Because in the game, there's a lot of um, history between uh, Camelot and the Saxon Empire and the small uh, archipelago of uh, Avalon. So um, all that uh, war stuff uh, that you can find in the real robot genre and that is not in the super robots um, mm -hmm. was a, a, a lot of uh, interest to me. And um, so that's why I tried to steer towards the real robots, even though um, you end up using the robots as you would use a super robot in a, in a game because... Uh, it's not uh, uh, highly detailed uh, mechanical uh, uh, features of the Mac that mm -hmm. I'm interested in, but the um, the connection between the pilot and uh, the robot, and um, so you end up using uh, the the knights as a super robot, but the themes that I ask you for uh, to to to, uh, to play in the game come from the real robots. Well, it is some. It is somewhat appropriate because I'm not. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but originally, um, originally, Gu originally, Gundam was supposed to be power armor. Yeah, it and by the way, in the late uh, this last years, Gundam uh, steered sometimes towards the super robot genre. So. It's not uh, a fine line. It's, no, it uh, it isn't. And even, yeah. And um. For and for what it's worth, the uh, the um the the um across community, which is which is basically the big the big community when it comes to the Super Robot Wars series of video games, which I'm really looking forward to get to getting my hands on thirty. Um, they don't they don't make the distinction anymore. Exactly. Um. In Super Robot Wars, you play a lot of Gundam characters, but they are actually Super Robots. So I completely uh, uh, da da dove into that kind of uh, reasoning, mm -hmm. and uh, I was actually playing uh, uh, Super Robot Wars while I was writing the game. So mm -hmm. maybe that was part of the influence. Yeah. I had. And on the on the other end of the sp uh, end of the um, spectrum is t is take is the school is the school drama part of it, um, and you me you mention Karekano, Rama One Half, Full Metal Panic, and um, Toradora as as po as points of as points of reference for that. Um, yeah. So now that now that partic that particular that particular genre is fairly self explanatory, but given given those given those th as well as um as well as aspects of um shonen now given those three particular subgenres how do you ba how do you balance that particular trinity out uh well um the super robots and real robots uh, are part of the themes uh, mm -hmm. you will play in the in the game especially the um, the relationships between uh, um, the different lineages and the uh, uh, people of the of, of Britain, which is the world uh, um, the game is set in, mm -hmm. while uh, the shonen and teen school drama uh, will make out the most uh, of the actual play, uh, the the gameplay of the of the Knights of the Round, because. Uh, from the shonen, I took the um, commitment uh, someone has to make to what they want to achieve, mm -hmm. 
how strong they want to become and um, how the friendships and the relationships in their life uh, will make them stronger um, even though they have a, a special talent or a, a really strong uh, physically speaking they will never be as strong as they can become uh, after they made the uh, meaningful relationships with those they encounter mm -hmm. both uh, allies and uh, enemies while the school drama and teen drama part um, have a specific um, part in the game because on your uh, character sheet which we call uh, a curriculum uh, you have two affinity slots which represents one or two of the most uh, important relationships you are trying to build during the game and those will uh, will actually give you access to some of the most power powerful things you can do in the game but you have to build those relationships by playing out uh, the um, whatever you have to do uh, during the game so it, you cannot just write uh, i'm in love with uh, someone and mm -hmm. uh, expect that to be technically irrelevant uh, during the game mm -hmm. you actually have to um, build scenes with the other characters to build that relationship you have to work on the relationship and uh, those are uh, excellent uh, role-playing uh, occasions for uh, everyone involved and during our playtest, which uh, went on for 18 months, because we started uh, developing uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, so it's been more than a year and a half, um, mm -hmm. we noticed that uh, those uh, scenes, the ones that uh, made up the affinity uh, part, were usually the most interesting one because uh, you actually heard in the in the scene the emotions your character was uh, feeling and um, they are really powerful and mm -hmm. they also have an impact on how you play the shonen part of the game so there's a balance in that because uh, um, the affinities and the traits that make up your character mm -hmm work basically the same you don't have uh, numbers that describe your uh, your student you only have your traits and traits are words or uh, small sentences that describe something of your of your character so um knowing what your relationships are uh what your character is willing to work on uh, what uh, your character um commits to it's really powerful and um, it makes a great a lot of um, role-playing uh, uh, material mm -hmm. for everyone the storyteller as well because when you play out relationships and uh, they go wrong and they go sour and uh, someone starts to hate you mm -hmm. they might become a villain in the um, in the campaign or uh, you might have to put a lot of work uh, to fix that relationship mm -hmm. and so you basically are building your character and your background and your uh, um, whole uh, idea of who the student you're playing is while playing there's no three pages background uh, you have to prepare before playing you mm -hmm. just build uh, your character with uh, what's on your sheet yeah now you mentioned earlier that this originally started out as a hack of not the end. Um, yeah. But do you can do you consider do you consider it still to have a lot have a lot of not the end's DNA, or did it evolve into its own thing with with um, time? Uh, it shares some uh, philosophical ideas uh, about the game design of uh, of of not the end. Mm -hmm. But uh, it grew up uh, as a completely different. Uh, different game um, they share the idea that your character is described by words and not numbers mm -hmm. that one is the main one 
and uh, we kept uh, the attention on uh, how you build your um, test pool um, and how you resolve uh, every test. Mm -hmm. and but there are differences there because mm -hmm. uh, in at the end you use tokens uh, that represent uh, um, both your traits and uh, the afflictions you have and the scars you have, mm -hmm. as well as the difficulty of a, of a test. And it's really quick to uh, build up the, the token pool uh, while it's slow to describe uh, how you resolve it because every token you, you draw from the, the, the bag, you have to spend on something. So if you drew five tokens, you have to decide what uh, is going towards the success of the test, uh, what is going towards... Uh, uh, setting up uh, the scene uh, for someone else and uh, what the negative tokens uh, will do to your character or the scene. Mm -hmm. In Knights of the Round, uh, we shifted the, the, the weight of uh, how you build uh, the pool. So it's slower to, bool, to build your pool of dice, but it's quicker to resolve the action and uh, it always, always have consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, there never is a test uh, that you simply fail and nothing happens. So whether you succeeded or failed, there's always something happening because uh, the test is what the, the storyteller can use to um, make the, uh, your enemies act or uh, uh, have something happen to you. And so those are the three pillars uh, Knights of the Round shares with uh, uh, Not the End. Mm -hmm. But um, everything else is quite different because um, they have a different focus. Mm -hmm. um, Not the End focuses on uh, heroes that want to sacrifice those themselves to achieve their goals, while Knights of the Round Academy uh, wants you to have uh, a shonen character uh, spend. Uh, all they can they, all they can to achieve that uh, that goal but not in a self sacrifice way in a shared expense of energy with the rest of the group mm -hmm. and uh, the mechanics at the core of uh, nuts of the round heavily um, rely on interaction with other characters you basically um, cannot uh, defeat your enemies in Knights of the Round, uh, when you act alone, you always have to uh, act uh, with uh, the other students. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest difference, I think, with Not the End, which uh, focuses on a single hero at a time. Yeah. Now, when it comes, when it comes to the 12 point setup when it, uh, that you, of character creation that you referred to in the quick start as the educational guidance procedure, yeah. um, there are a few questions that I that I had on that I had on some on some parts of it. Um, obvi obviously, I'm not going to have many questions on the name part of it because not a whole lot to dissect, to dissect about that part. <laughs> um, but I'd like I'd like to I'd like to start I'd like to start out with um, with li with lineages. So you ha so if i'm not mistaken you ha there are going to be seven of them in the book each of them with four different um le legacies of which you're picking one of them yeah um you get in the quick start you give the example of ancient blood as a le as a legacy um what would be a few other examples of legacies tied to uh, tied to uh, tied to other um other other lineages besides dragon blood uh, well, uh, let me get the document, the, the quick start document, so I can uh, share uh, the things we haven't translated yet, because uh, in Italian we have um, the whole uh, core book already written, so it's just a matter of translating it, and here it is. So, for example, uh, the androids, uh, which are biomechanical beings built for the war, and they now have uh, independence. And, uh, uh, for example, some of their legacies are a biomechanic interface, so you can talk 
uh, with the machines mm -hmm. as if they were persons or uh, they have uh, um, bio sensors so they can understand what others are feeling and they have an um, extra die when they try to convince them or um, get some information from them because they can function as a um, truth uh, machine. Um, Avalon, Avalonians, uh, um, which are basically the elves of uh, Knights of the Round uh, Academy because mm -hmm. they age really slowly, uh, they have point years, they live uh, separated from uh, every other people in Britain. Um, they share, they, they have um, a, a few legacies like uh, uh, tourist. Mm -hmm. So you left Avalon a long ago and you have been traveling uh, through Britain. So whenever you try to um, use your knowledge of uh, the customs of a, of a place or someone or a people, you have a bonus. So you cannot make a, a disaster, which is really something you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, you can stay in the scene whenever you finish your uh, limit points, which are a, a limited uh, uh, resource you have to spend to during your test or uh, to use uh, some techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bretons, uh, for example can have a, um, a double job, uh, an extra job. In the game, you can have two jobs at a time, but Bretons can have three jobs, so they have access to a lot of more uh, techniques than uh, other um, lineages. Or they can um, double the help they get from uh, someone they love or uh, share a, a relationship uh, with. Um, people from the colonies, um, can navigate uh, uh, the space, mm -hmm. which other uh, lineages cannot do because they actually live in space. And uh, there's uh, the new kind uh, legacy, because I can could not use the new type uh, name, but they basically act the same. They can feel uh, other um, people's emotions unless they are new kinds uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the Saxon uh, people, uh, um, for example, uh, might be without core. So the core is a, a trait that links the, the character, binds the character to an element, fire, water, whatever it is. But mm -hmm. uh, since what happened uh, during the war, they might be without a core, and so they are knight uh, cannot be disabled the same way the other knights are disabled because mm -hmm. they don't share the same energy uh, other people do. Mm -hmm. Or they can use their legacy as uh, an extra um, hit point uh, when they are facing their nemesis. Mm -hmm. And maybe the ones I like the most are the Sida, um, which are shape-shifting uh, vagrants and uh, their legacy shapeshifter mm -hmm. um, allows them to change in whatever beast they can imagine mm -hmm. but there's also the taboo legacy and so um, a character with the, this legacy can only become the creatures they kill mm -hmm. and this opens up a lot of um, interesting uh, ideas for roleplay because uh, there's always this, um, this uh, struggle uh, within the character to kill someone or not to kill someone because then I become the, that person, I will uh, have their memories uh, and uh, I might lose myself in the memories of those uh, I kill mm -hmm. and that's really great for roleplay. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to core, um, the essentially the essentially the el the element that the stu that the student and the knight are about are bound to through the dragon's breath, um, yeah. Are 
are you using the hel are you using the Hellenistic elements for for that, or you or are you um are you going a bit freeform when it comes to what elements are available? Uh, it's really freeform. Uh, there's a list of um, suggestions if you mm -hmm. want to make a quick uh, character, and I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So of course there will be some suggestions, but the a real suggestion is to go with your heart and uh, during our uh, play test I saw someone using love as an element uh, using uh, mind uh, using uh, corruption uh, using uh, void so there's a lot of um, of stuff that you can do with the the core because that's more of an idea uh, you are bound to and uh, while it's it, it, while it comes from an alchemical uh, idea of what an element is, um, there's uh, really a lot of freedom with what you can do. And since uh, the element you are bound to also is really freeformer, so if you choose fire, for example, you might interpret it as uh, I will destroy everything on my path, mm -hmm. or you can also see your fire as the kindling fire of a fireplace. So you might focus on healing others, uh, making them feel better. So um, no matter the element you choose, you will have to um, think outside the box to put it in play. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to go over and uh, beyond uh, with uh, the element you want to choose, uh, you are free to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the now when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to when it comes to things like a lot of the rest of them, I there's not a whole there's not a whole lot to de to delve into because they're pretty they're pretty self explanatory. The one, the one that I do, th I do think, I, sh I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a bit more on is, on the way, your choice of job works. Um. And I'm obviously, tr obviously trying to go through all of them. All of them, we'd be, we'd be here for days if we did that. Yeah. <laughs> so. What I so what I'd like so what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to ask is. What is what age? What a job um, grants the grants the player. So um, there are fifteen jobs mm -hmm. within the games, and each have um, four techniques that you will uh, you will be able to use during uh, your sessions. Each job has a, a basic technique, which is always available mm -hmm. to your student. So. They will always be able, for example, uh, uh, the cadet has the basic technique to um, use their memories uh, uh, to, to get to, um, sorry, you, <laughs> hold on, um, because I changed that, uh, that technique a lot uh, mm -hmm. since the cadet is the most used uh, one and so we had a lot of, of play tests around it mm -hmm. so let me get the latest uh, version of the of the technique uh, which is also on uh, the update we made a few days ago okay uh, their base technique uh, okay they can use the name as an uh, extra wound Mm -hmm. So uh, an extra hit point. Um, there's uh, the night technique. Mm -hmm. They have uh, only when they are on their night, mm -hmm. or at least uh, on a night. So the cadet, for example, um, restores uh, some limit points whenever they get on uh, a night mm -hmm. during your scene. There's the overdrive technique, which is only available when uh, you spend the first eight limit points and uh, get into overdrive. Mm -hmm. So they are always really powerful and uh, give you a lot of uh, action to, to do. Mm -hmm. And the advanced technique will only be available um, if you unlock all your memories. And there are three memories um, to unlock during uh, 
the campaign, mm -hmm. which are the main way your character will evolve. So when you unlock a memory, you add a new trait, you add a new memory, which allows you to reroll a test and you will uh, uh, work uh, towards the advanced technique. Yeah. Um. Oh. Now, when it now when it comes to even now, I get the I get the feeling that um, given that you mentioned that a lot of people ended up picking cadet, that th that there was the there was the assumption that only that only cadets would be would be doing would be doing knights, but um, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, you have it where ev where um every ca every character um has a knight. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Every cadet, uh, every character has a knight, not mm -hmm. only the cadet, mm -hmm. and um, they might not uh, have it at the start of the campaign. If you want to have a long uh, campaign with knights of the round, it might be useful to start as a student and then add your knight uh, during uh, the, the course of the campaign. We usually uh, introduce them uh, in the fourth or fifth uh, episode of the campaign, mm -hmm. so players can uh, acclimate, acclimate uh, with their students, uh, get to know their students, get to know the other students, before a new layer of complexity to to the game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, every job, every character um, has a knight. Uh, testing to them so mm -hmm. and when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to their particular frames is is the we mentioned we mentioned before about the pool of techniques that jo that characters jobs have is it a similar setup with an with a knight's choice of frame uh, no, the frame uh, is something uh, more akin to the core. So it's a trait that describes uh, the function of your knight. So mm -hmm. you might have a tank, uh, you might have a lancer. We call them lancer in uh, the light of faith, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is more focused on uh, melee combat. Uh, the scouter, caster, and you might add uh, every kind of uh, frame you want uh, it's just a trait as any other trait, but mm -hmm. uh, instead of adding a 1d8 to your pool, it will add a 1d12. Yeah. Because it's a knight. Now, we've talked, we've, you admit, you had mentioned, you had mentioned the whole, the whole thing with, um, oh, with, with, with overload and, and its relationship to overdrive techniques. Um, narratively, what is, what is what is limit and overload, and how and how does it work in the mechanics? Limit points represent uh, how how much your uh, uh, student uh, is under pressure mm -hmm. or uh, is uh, committing to something. So you usually spend uh, limit points when you want to add dice to your pool to have a better result. When you want to change uh, a negative consequence in a success. Um, but they are a limited resource, um, and uh, there are two things that might happen when you spend limit points. Mm -hmm. First one is uh, after you spent your eighth uh, uh, limit point, you will enter the overdrive state, and this uh, will give you access to the overdrive techniques, but it will also uh, mean your character is really uh, giving all they can, mm -hmm. and that means that uh, when whenever you roll uh, a test, uh, the results will always be critical, whether they are positive or negative. So, um, a normal success will become a triumph, and a uh, normal consequence will become a disaster. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of life and death um, at at that point. So everything you do is uh, really. Uh, dramatic it's really important to the scene and uh, you have a lot of um, limit points you can spend while you are in overdrive mm -hmm. you start with uh, only three points actually but as you unlock the memories you will add more and more limit points uh, you can spend while in overdrive when you finish 
your uh, overdrive capacity, your character is out of the scene. They might be too tired, uh, too wounded, uh, they might be just uh, uh, out of control. They, wh whatever it is, they will be out of your uh, control. They won't be able to do anything uh, unless uh, someone else uh, tries to bring them back um, through a test uh, by giving them uh, limit points uh, or uh, whatever it is they will think of uh, while playing. Mm -hmm. But uh, every mechanic in the game uh, pushes you towards the, um, the overdrive because that's when uh, things actually uh, <laughs> actually happen. So the limit points um, are are a limited resource that you have mm -hmm. to spend to get to the real game. Mm -hmm. Once you are in overdrive, you are really playing <laughs> of their own account. Yeah. Oh. Now, speak, speaking of that, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the core mechanics, this is this is still this is still a die pool um, based game, as I, as I understand it. Yeah. Um, but. Is it is it a case where no ma where no matter no matter the circumstances you're always going to be rolling six dice? Uh, you actually might go up to twelve dice um, because the core mechanic works like this. Uh, you count the traits on your curriculum that might be useful to whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. and those are the eights you add to the pool. Then the storyteller tells you. Uh, if there's a difficulty, how difficult the test is, and mm -hmm. it might go from one to six, each point of difficulty will change one of those dice into a d6. And if you are facing a, um, a threat, which are um, enemies with a name, basically, mm -hmm. they might have uh, traits that will change the d6s in d4. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm, normal pool you will uh, you might build. So those will be six dice. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, you might want to spend limit points, or your um, fellows might want to spend limit points to help you. And by spending limit points, you will be able to add the uh, d12s to uh, the pool, and those will go over the six limit dice. Mm -hmm. So you might uh, end up with uh, 12 dice. That's the maximum number of dice you, you can roll in a single test. And After you roll the dice, mm -hmm. you keep the highest uh, positive dice, mm -hmm. uh, po positive die, so the highest between the d8s the and the 12, mm -hmm. and the highest of the negative dice, so the d4s and the 6s, mm -hmm. and uh, you uh, compare them to the success uh, scale. Uh, six and more is always a success. Five and or less is a failure mm -hmm. with, or a consequence. And then you will have um, a combination of uh, success and success, success and failure, failure and failure. Mm -hmm. So there are three levels of uh, how good or bad uh, a test will go. And uh, on top of those, uh, you will uh, count uh, each 12 on uh, the 12, which is a triumph. Mm -hmm. And uh, every one on a negative die is a disaster. So if you roll a lot of uh, negative dice, uh, it's easy for you to end up with a 6 on a d6 mm -hmm. because you are uh, rolling a lot of those. But it also means that uh, it's really easy to end up with one or more disasters as well. Mm -hmm. And when you have D4s in the, in the pool, uh, you know they won't be able to uh, roll a success and they have a higher chance to roll a disaster. Yep. And with, the, with, that, with that particular thing in mind, um, when it um, do you, how do you, how do you tip in the times that you've done playtests, how do you make how do you maintain the 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 all these different die types to make sure that th that there isn't confusion? Have you done have you done a setup where you use different colored die for different um for different types? Yeah, um, 
we did that and uh, that's what we are doing in the Kickstarter campaign as well. The negative dice will uh, be red and have a broken sword um, that corresponds to disasters, mm -hmm. while the positive dice uh, will be white and blue and uh, they have um, the heart uh, that makes up the Academy uh, logo on, on the D12s to mm -hmm. correspond to the triumphs. Mm -hmm. So when you roll them, uh, you, you, you quickly see um, what's the highest number on the negative and the positive and whether there are disasters and triumphs. Mm -hmm. Now, with it, now within the within the set within the um, setup, um, is it a because of the because of the fact that your that your 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 starting die pool is going to be based on your tr your trade? Is that are you go is the game going to be encouraging people to um, creatively to creatively use as many traits as they as they can in in die rolls? Yeah, um, it's really easy for a character to end up with uh, six dice in their uh, starting pool, mm -hmm. and that's good. That's what the games the, the game tries to push you towards. So, um, thinking outside the box, using uh, traits like uh, patient, uh, both to mean uh, that your student is patient. Uh, or that you are treating a patient uh, in a hospital, mm -hmm. that's fine. That's what the game tries to, to do. Uh, traits have to be used uh, creatively. Um, and when they have um, more than a meaning, more than just one meaning, uh, they are good traits. They, you, you might also um, want to add uh, chosen one to your traits. Uh, maybe you are playing uh, Arthur. Uh, you are not uh, king yet, so you are the chosen one. That's a trait you might end up using in every single test, and that's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. um, this is another difference between uh, Not the End and Knights of the Round, for example. In Not the End, uh, uh, traits like uh, chosen one are um, basically forbidden because uh, it's not fun in the end to add a lot of positive token to your bag. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Knights of the Round Academy, the more traits you you might add to a test, uh, the more the test uh, is up in your alley and it means you are doing a, a great job uh, playing your character, basically. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's what you should do. Mm-hmm. Now, huh? Now, um, when when we bring Me when we bring Mac into the picture, the knights, um, does is the dice is the die pool system change significantly or not all that much? The knights uh, add uh, extra d12s to your pool, so mm -hmm. um, if you are facing uh, maybe let's say a kaiju. Mm -hmm. and you are uh, on foot, you will have to spend a lot of limit points to add just one D12 to your pool and hope for the best. Um, when you're on your night, you know you have uh, at least one D12 free of charge because you are on a night, and if you're using your frame, uh, you will have an extra D12 free of charge. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the core mechanic doesn't change. You will uh, still have to add uh, your uh, character's traits to the pool because uh, in Knights of the Round, and this is one of the pillars of uh, Knights of the Round, uh, the pilot and the robot uh, are not uh, different. They are not separated. They are one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, when the, um, the knight is wounded, uh, the pilot will feel it. Mm -hmm. the, the wound himself or themselves so kind of like in the super robots of old uh, when um, a lightning uh, uh, stroke the the super robot uh, the pilot felt the the lightning as well mm -hmm. and so when you build the the pool for a test uh, using a knight 
you are doing it uh, as a pilot and as a knight at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to now, if I'm now, if I'm not mistaken, both both your on foot equipment and the equipment or abil or abilities of a of a knight are going to be are going to be in their own particular type of trait in the form of equipment. Yeah, and they work uh, um, kind of like uh, Blades in the Dark. If you mm -hmm. played uh, that, you know that the items uh, um, you don't have to choose the items beforehand. You just need to select uh, those uh, when you need them. And in Knights of the Round Academy, it's basically the same. So um, before rolling a test, you might you might uh, want to add uh, an item to your uh, curriculum to say hi i have uh, a gun okay uh, and that allows you to do um, something that you uh, wouldn't be able to do otherwise saying shooting or it might help you to achieve what you are trying to do so maybe you are trying to um, translate an ancient uh, Avalonian um, roll, scroll and uh, you add your dictionary to the items and that will give you a bonus to the test you're about to do. You mm -hmm. might to be able to try and translate it anyway, but having a dictionary will uh, be useful for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it, when it comes to when it comes to the way when it comes to the way wounds work, it seems like you've got a um, three strikes set up with the core traits, the tra the traits with the red border. Yeah, exactly. They are the heart of your student, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are the most basic uh, things your student is. So one is the core, one is uh, his soul, mm -hmm. and one is the lineage they belong to. Mm -hmm. And um, when you when you are wounded, you have to mark one of those and you won't be able to use them uh, in a test um, mm -hmm. unless you get healed or uh, have time to recover. And uh, obviously, this doesn't mean that uh, you stop being uh, uh, a Breton uh, or that you stop being a stubborn pilot. Mm -hmm. It just means that uh, uh, in the fiction of the scene you're playing, uh, they won't be useful to you. Mm -hmm. You might still uh, say, I'm uh, a shapeshifter, okay? You can still shapeshift, but uh, the enemies, the situation, uh, whatever it is, uh, um, they adapted to what you are doing, and so that won't give you an edge mm -hmm. during a test. Yeah. Now... With now, with that in with that in mind, I'd like to talk a bit about um, advancement and how th and how that's going to work, especially given the memory mechanic that you've that you brought up previously. Yeah, um, that's something we actually started doing uh, during the podcast uh, mm -hmm. um, a few times, a lot of times actually. Um, we found ourselves uh, uh, with a player missing uh, on uh, a game night mm -hmm. because uh, of whatever the reason might be. And uh, instead of uh, skipping the, the session, we started playing flashbacks mm -hmm. to um, both uh, explore the past of a, a character and uh, keep playing uh, the same uh, narrative arc, but... Uh, uh, shifting the focus uh, on something uh, different for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in Knights of the Round Academy, um, the best thing you can do to have your character grow, because uh, uh, it's growth uh, I'm interested in, as they are students, they are teenagers. Mm -hmm. Whenever you want to explore um, one of your memories or you are forced to play a flashback. Um, the player and the storyteller uh, decide uh, where the flashback will start, and that will be a whole session focusing on a single character mm -hmm. and its past. Um, they will uh, decide uh, how long ago uh, um, the flashback will uh, will be set, 
mm-hmm. who are the secondary characters in the flashback that the other players will be playing and uh, um, what's the main theme uh, the, the player wants to explore during the flashback mm-hmm. maybe it's the scenes uh, of our fathers maybe it's uh, who am I and why uh, I've been uh, adopted uh, or anything else that might come to, to mind mm-hmm. the players will play out the, the flashback session and uh, the, the protagonist player will only be able to add a new memory at the end of the flashback session. So mm-hmm. they will know where they start, they won't uh, know where they will uh, end and uh, what their memory will be. Mm-hmm. And this way you uh, explore your uh, character's background by playing it and uh, you give a lot of uh, fuel to the storyteller that will be able to use the characters in the flashback as uh, recurring characters during the campaign. Um, a lot of villains were born in the flashback uh, sessions during the playtest. Uh, basically, in every campaign we ever played, uh, mm-hmm. the big bad evil guy at the end was someone from some flashback uh, at, at the start of the campaign. And um, this is also a really shown and way to explore characters because uh, if you think about it for example uh, with naruto black clover and uh, all those kind of anime mm-hmm. the characters uh, grow when they show where they are from uh, what their past has been uh, what uh, they had to face uh, or what uh, their uh, family did in the past and so uh, you you show something of your character uh, by playing their past. Mm-hmm. This will also give you access to new uh, trait slots um, that we you will be able to to add uh, by exploring themes during the normal uh, sessions. Mm-hmm. But the memory is uh, really the, the core mechanic because uh, it tells a lot of your character. It will uh, give you access to more limit points. Uh, it will allow to uh, re-roll tests. Um, so that's basically the most interesting part about the character growth mm-hmm. in, uh, in uh, Knights of the Round Academy. Yeah. Now, with... With that, with that kind of thing, in, with that kind of thing in mind, the other, the other aspect I wanted to cover in this is the location sheet and how similar or different that is set up compared to a uh, character sheet proper. Well, uh, the location sheets are a tool that you might use in uh, Knights of the Round Academy to um, map and track the locations you you put in the scenes. You're playing. Mm-hmm. Um, they are always made up of uh, uh, three squares and three circles. Uh, in the squares, you will add uh, the features of the place you are uh, trying to describe. Maybe uh, if the, for example, the location sheet is the academy one, uh, you might add uh, uh, your dorm, mm-hmm. uh, the cafeteria, and uh, the arena mm-hmm. where you will have to train with the knights. Yeah. In the circles, you will add uh, someone related to that place. So maybe it's the janitor that uh, uh, fixes uh, the um, the arena after every battle, or maybe it's the funny waitress in the cafeteria, or um, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, adding more and more location sheets to the campaign will give you access uh, to a lot of ideas on where to set your se- your scenes and uh, who the characters involved uh, might be. Mm-hmm. And it's also a fractal system. So uh, if you had the academy uh, location sheet with the dorm uh, feature, mm-hmm. you might add a, a dorm location sheet to describe uh, what's in uh, the in in your dorm. So maybe mm-hmm. uh, there's a, a pool. There's a, the room and uh, I don't know something mm-hmm. else 
but the point is um, that it's a fractal tool so it's going to be as specific as you want mm -hmm. while keeping it uh, um, in a clear frame for everyone and uh, it also helps you not to over describe what you are um, putting in the, in the game mm -hmm. uh, using the location sheets will allow you to only describe what you are actually interested in mm -hmm. so you don't have to write every single name of every single village you cross because maybe they are not interesting at all mm -hmm. and focus only on those that have something to tell the students or the players mm -hmm. and when it comes to when it, com when it comes to creating a threat um i think it would be tempting for threats to be it to be a to be a named antagonist but the way you've described it it's it sounds like it it can be that but it's not limited to it yeah in the in the core book there will be some examples for uh for instance uh, there's a um, an avalonian dungeon which is a threat and uh, the traits the the dungeon will put in play are the traps uh, uh, are the monsters roaming uh, the corridors and uh, and such uh, a threat it's something uh, that uh, it's not only dangerous um, mm -hmm. it has something uh, more to it it mm -hmm. will be something the students will have to remember um, it might take up uh, a whole session to defeat it and um, as you said, it's not just a, a single character or a, um, a, a creature, but it might be every uh, every instance of a, a dangerous situation, for example. Mm -hmm. So the dungeon, so the uh, assault on uh, Lyoness, mm -hmm. uh, a nearby city. Um, the students are in at the moment. The assault itself might be a, a threat mm -hmm. and uh, more threats might be present so there might be the main threat that is the assault but there might be even the terrorists uh, assaulting and that will add up to the difficulty of the of the tests they will have to face mm -hmm. and when and the this brings me this brings me to one to one other um one other aspect that was t that was touched upon in a in an update, but uh, but I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't bring it up because it is so in keeping with the, the sort with the source material, and that is, um, Nightball. Oh yeah. Um. Now, a lot of times when I've seen when I've seen when I've seen fa when I've seen fantasy sports within. Within it, within a well, fantasy or an SF setting, there's usually some sort some sort of analog. It's the reason why I ranted about pro bending when I had to sit through the Legend of Korra because there wasn't a, because there wasn't one. Um, mm -hmm. Like in Final Fantasy X, Blitzball is ver is very clearly um, is very clearly taking taking nods from from rugby. Um, and there and there's or, and to, and to a certain degree, football. Um, but when it comes to when it comes to nightball, what's what sort of real world sport would you would you say that it's analogous to? Well, uh, rugby uh, mm -hmm. for sure, as you will have to um, take control of a of a ball and uh, score in mm -hmm. uh, the in the opposite uh, uh, part of the field mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm afraid that the simplest way to describe it is Quidditch uh, with Gundam <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's what Nightfall uh, actually is I, I'm afraid well bo both of the both of the, well, Quid well Quidditch isn't exactly for the faint of heart either so I, so I can go with that yeah, and Nightball uh, uh, started out as a, an inside joke. We wanted to have a sport that the students might play. And we imagined the, the Nightball. Uh, we called it Nightball because uh, 
it's also similar to football in mm -hmm. some way and um, you have to play it with uh, your knights and you can use uh, everything uh, you you can to score that uh, the point mm -hmm. so you can use your knight you can use your core you can use your techniques and uh, um, we will be adding uh, rules to to play it um, we are actually going to add two different ways to to play nightball mm -hmm. one more in line with the narrative of the of the game and uh, it will uh, rely heavily on flashbacks because uh, we are taking uh, uh, captain subasa as a inspiration mm -hmm. for that part of the of the game but it will also be a um, print and play one on one uh, card game mm -hmm. so if you just want to have a quick fun uh, game uh, before uh, starting uh, your, your session uh, you will be able to do it yeah um and tr truth be told when i saw when i saw that what immediately came to mind for me was not captain subasa but actually basquash which was ba which was basically what happens when when um set when the animation studio satellite decides Hey, let's hey let's mix let's mix mecha with basketball. Yeah. And yeah, uh, somehow it works. It's bonkers, but it works. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the rules themselves will be more in uh, the Captain Subaza alley mm -hmm. uh, because um, you want to actually play the the, the game itself. Uh, you will be playing. Uh, the most dramatic moments of the game mm -hmm. and Captain Tsubasa uh, has a, a lot of, uh, of those plus in Italy it's uh, probably the most famous uh, Spokon there ever was so for, uh, for us it's something really close to, to the heart mm -hmm. now with now with that with that in, with that in, with that in mind um, there is one particular cli there is one particular cliche that I f that given given the shonen underpinnings I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up and that it and that is the good old fashioned tournament arc. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now I I realize this would probably fall into the realm of GM advice, but is but is the possibility of that kind of angle something that's been con something that's been considered uh yes and it actually is one of the stretch goals we hope to unlock um mm -hmm. it should be the 58000 uh, euros stretch goal um and uh, emanuele galletto which is the author of fabula ultima mm -hmm. uh, um, a jrpg inspired tabletop game mm -hmm. will be writing the rules uh, for tournaments um using uh, the War of the Bands uh, mm -hmm. as an example. And that's exactly where we want to go with that. So giving, giving you the rules to um, put on a tournament of whatever you want to do mm -hmm. and using Nemesis uh, uh, as your opponents and uh, giving you simple rules to both uh, do a, um, a team play or a uh, single play during the tournament and that will all, of course be part of the night ball as well mm -hmm. uh, if we if we reach that goal uh, all right i can i can certainly get i can certainly get behind that um but you i think you had also mentioned that even th uh, even though there's some some bullet points with these with the setting you you you've left it in t you've left certain parts intentionally vague so that um G so that GMs could fill in the blank and do their own interpretation of the concept yes um there's a clear frame of what Britain is what the relationships with between Camelot and Saxon are mm -hmm. um how the different uh, people see each other so how the androids uh, uh, or the see the are seen by by others 
but I also wanted to give the players and the storyteller as well uh, a lot of freedom to describe their own world. So um, there are hints of uh, history lessons uh, uh, here and there mm -hmm. in the core book, but what actually happened um, has never is never told in uh, in the manual. Um, there are lots of suggestions for places in different continents, but there are no pinpoints on the map of where those are, um, if they actually exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a big part of the, of the game because um, sometimes when you have a heavy lower uh, setting, the players that know it well uh, play different uh, than those that have no idea what uh, the world they are playing in uh, is. Mm -hmm. So uh, if maybe we take uh, the Forgotten Realms, for example, which is a setting I grew up with. I played it for 15 years uh, and I knew it uh, every single village of the Sword Coast uh, by, by heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, whenever I played with uh, a friend that never played the, the Forgotten Realms, they had no idea what they were doing, and we ended up uh, discussing uh, of what they can uh, or cannot do with the character, uh, secondary character, uh, some specific place, and so on. Mm -hmm. If you remove that and only leave the frame of uh, what the relationships in that world are, and that's something that can take up one page to describe everyone is on the same level of knowledge of the lore because there is no lore to know mm -hmm. and you can build your own lore while you are playing so for example uh, a character I refer to in the core book is Dr. Merlin mm -hmm. or which is the genius who created the knights but who is Dr. Merlin actually is never told anywhere in uh, in the core book. Mm -hmm. You might want to describe him as a good-hearted uh, person, as a terrible uh, mad scientist or anything in between, and it would be right every time because uh, who Dr. Merlin is, is up to you. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with the locations. I say, here's the academy. Here's where you will start because the academy is the focus of the game. But feel free to add whatever you want to the world itself. So if you start by asking the, the, the students where they are from and what that kind of place uh, mm -hmm. uh, they come from, you might want to add a location sheet for, uh, for those. And uh, then you start uh, painting the, the, the world with what whatever it's of interest of you and uh, the the group and not uh, what interests me as a game designer mm -hmm. now what are you what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book um put taking i know i know that that's going i know that that's going to be in flux because of um stre because of stretch goals but just for the base stuff putting that aside what are you shooting for um for the basic uh, stuff we already have, uh, it's about uh, 320, 30 pages. But I think uh, we will go up to 360, 370, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what are you aiming for as far as a release window? So um, we already have the Italian content, uh, stretch goals excluded, but uh, the um, most uh, most is already there. And uh, in the core book, uh, we'll end up uh, uh, only with the uh, short chapters. Uh, um, we are already writing because uh, we are already ha uh, we already had uh, reached the, those stretch goals. And that's uh, how to use an opening to describe uh, your uh, students and uh, open your session, as well as a deep dive on the affinities. Mm -hmm. Everything else will be a digital stretch goal. So we are more or less sure of uh, 
when we will be closing the Italian content. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that uh, by the end of the year, we'll have the complete uh, Italian core book and we will have to uh, translate it. And that should be done in uh, January. Mm -hmm. So uh, by Feb February, we are going to print the, the game, both in Italian and uh, in uh, English. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, up to April to deliver it. As we know, there might be some uh, hiccups during uh, production, but we already accounted those for. So um, by April, which is fine, be funny because uh, it's also my birthday, we'll mm -hmm. be shipping those uh, to everyone. Right, no, I will. I will most certainly be looking forward to see to seeing that. Um. But but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. I really have to thank you because uh, this was a really fine interview and uh, it was my first uh, international interview, so I was um, a little on my toes, but you made me feel at, at home, so mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it, whether it's to... Whether it's to fur further go into um, Knights of the Round, or to or to get or to or to see how long it takes before someone brings up Monty Python in 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 a session, because I feel it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, the door is always open, as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you, and I think I will get in touch with you for our next project. Mm -hmm. um, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, we will be writing the Cowboy Bebop official role-playing game. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>